We have a <laughs> message for all of you that I want to make clear in my remarks today. As someone who's been working in the field of public health and was the uh, founding director of the Board on Environmental Studies and Toxicology at the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, I've seen how America discusses issues of public health and safety. And in all cases, <clears throat> from tobacco to asbestos to vinyl chloride to hormone replacement therapy, we insist on proof of human harm and damage before taking steps to prevent that harm. And basically it means sacrificing one generation eventually to protect another. I want to just give you some examples just to set the context. These are ads that actually appeared <clears throat> in the Journal of the American Medical Association showing doctors smoking cigarettes and they weren't hard to find because at one point 70 percent of all surgeons actually smoked. And there was a huge debate in the scientific community about whether or not tobacco smoke was truly harmful or whether the <clears throat> few people they thought then who developed lung cancer had a genetic weakness that predisposed them to it. So this was a serious effort and the American Cancer Society actually accepted funds from the tobacco industry and the Tobacco Industry Research Council was a very reputable group because back then there wasn't a lot of funding for research and they funded research at Harvard and Yale and many other places as I've documented in my books and scientific writings. And there was even a marketing campaign <clears throat> to aim to the fact that women always want to lose weight saying reach for a lucky instead of a sweet it will help you lose weight. In fact it is true nicotine does stimulate and suppress the appetite but the idea that this was a marketing campaign to encourage women to smoke which was very very effective this was an example <clears throat> of what we saw in our society in the beginning. This is an ad that you may not ever have recalled seeing about why asbestos <clears throat> can save your life if you happen to be a race car driver and a car that crashes. When life depends on it, you use asbestos. Well, we now know that there's a relatively rare lung type cancer called mesothelioma, where one in three cases that occurs now has no known history of working with asbestos, which is telling us that environmental exposures to asbestos have in fact caused this rare cancer and will continue to do so. This, believe it or not, was an ad for asbestos in a baby suit so that we could protect our children from burning in a fire. Uh, I think it speaks for itself and I can say to you as someone who's worked on public policy now for more than 35 years, when we look at the requirements that we put upon evidence on the dangers of passive smoke and on the dangers of asbestos, I don't think there's anyone in this room or anyone listening around the world who would think that we did not <clears throat> delay more time than we should have. And people are paying the price today for those delays. Now I want to review with you some experimental studies on wireless radiation exposure to the brains and behavior of rats <clears throat> and rabbits and mice. And I want to show you the results here from Gazi University, uh, from Athens University, and from the Turkish Ministry of Health, I was able to collaborate with very distinguished colleagues there in Turkey, including Professor Nezrin Sahan, who is the founding chairman of Faculty of Medicine of Biophysics. And after the presentation that we developed in Turkey on this, the Turkish Ministry of Health banned advertising of cell phones with and to children, something that has been done in Belgium and is being done in other nations. They don't have trash-talking E-Trade babies in those countries. Now, <clears throat> this is just one example from the scientific literature, and more detailed studies can be found on the website for the Baby Safe Project and on the website for Environmental Health Trust. We are a scientific group that does research, primary research in this field, as well as develops public policy recommendations and education. This is one example from one study here by Professor Nezrin Sahan and her colleagues that looked at DNA damage in animals that were not exposed to cell phone-like wireless radiation and animals that were. Now a word about radiation. A cell phone and a microwave radio use the same frequency, about 2.4 billion cycles a second or 900 million cycles a second. The power of a microwave oven is about a thousand watts or 750 watts. 
So it's very powerful, and it can, in fact, boil a cup of water in about a minute or two. A cell phone is very weak in power, but the, the biological effect of the microwave radiation from the two-way radio that is your cell phone is not due to its power, but to its irregular erratic signal, which disturbs cells. And you can see evidence of this in this study from Professor Sahan and her team. We're looking here at something called 8-hydroxyguanine, which is a d in DNA. It's the question of whether you can go into the DNA and form an addict, that an adduct, an adduct that gloms on to the basic nucleotide that's building and holding your DNA together. And this is showing that in the control groups, you get a very modest damage, but in the exposed groups, indicated here, you get three times more DNA damage just from exposure 15 minutes a day for seven days when it's prenatal. The prenatal time, as we say in the baby wireless pamphlet, is a time of exquisite sensitivity. The faster cells grow, the more vulnerable they are to toxic exposures. We take great steps to protect the pregnant abdomen and to protect the brain and fast-growing cells in the human body. Now I want to talk to you about the work of Professor Suleiman Kaplan, who is the chairman of the Department of Histology Embryology at Andakuz Mayuz University, where I was privileged to meet with him and his extensive team of researchers. They also have studied prenatal exposure to microwave transmitting devices, and they have found that not only does it affect behavior, but it actually affects the brain. The hippocampus is the part of the brain that we use for thinking and memory. Professor Taylor showed you behavioral effects of cell phone radiation. This work, which was published in Brain Research, ties very nicely with his work because what it shows is that you see in the control cells here, and I'm sure those of you who are not pathologists, you can see they're nicely packed and orderly and dense. Cells are supposed to be in line, right? They're supposed to stay together. These cells on the other side are exposed and these cells are not exposed. Exposure took place early, early uh, in life, late in pregnancy, and the results you can see quite r right here is that there are fewer brain cells, fewer brain cells, and they're more in disarray if they were exposed to this radiation. Uh, similar the results here are what's called pyramidal cells, which are a type of cell within the hippocampus, and again, this is the thinking and memory part of the brain. You see, again, the disarray here in the exposed. This is the same magnification. There are more cells here. They're tighter together. There are fewer cells here. This is the work of Professor Odachi, also in Turkey. Now, I should say a word about this. <clears throat> We're dealing with a very complex phenomenon. I myself am trained in toxicology and epidemiology. I was a member of the Board of Scientific Counselors of the National Toxicology Program of the U.S. government. And we understand this is a complex issue scientifically. But right now, we are treating our children like experiments in a subject with no controls. It would be unethical if we were to say, let's take one group of pregnant women and expose them to cell phone radiation and the other group not. It would be unethical if we gave pregnant women alcohol, if we gave them tobacco and then said, let's study what's happening. So we need to understand that what we're doing now is really makes no sense biologically based on this experimental work because we're not mice or rats, but genetically we're not that different from them. And when it comes to developing drugs, we test them in mice and rats in order to decide whether it's appropriate to apply them to humans. Now what we're doing is we're exposing humans to this radiation, waiting till we get the data to show whether or not it's harmful, I think that there's something fundamentally wrong with that, and we at Environmental Health Trust are thrilled to be working with grassroots environmental education to see that you all get more information about this. So I finally want to show you some studies also done with colleagues in Turkey on prenatal exposure to wireless transmitting devices that not only damage the brain and, and damage behavior, as Professor Taylor has shown you, but also damage the testes. And think again, rapidly growing cells are the most vulnerable. The brain of a baby more than doubles after birth and grows so many fold from early in pregnancy that I've never seen a, a number on it. Prenatally exposed newborns here develop compromised spinal cords.
Now the spinal cord is the part of the embryo that ultimately becomes the brain. It starts out with just one cord and it grows in size and density so that the top of it becomes the brain. And this is showing you here that in the unexposed you have kind of nice cell full um, development in the center and right here you can see it's literally missing about half of what should be there. Now, this is a stunning result uh, obtained from Professor Adachi in a paper that has just come online, although it was published 2013, it's not been reported in the literature. And we have all of that available for you on the website as well. <clears throat> and these are behavioral tests with these same exposed animals showing that when it comes to taking animals that have been deprived of food so that they're, they want, they're hungry and they want to get a reward and you put them in a radial arm maze so they have to learn where to get the food. The animals, the, the control animals can get there really fast with little delay and the EMF group that's previously been trained gets lost and they have a harder time finding food and they make more mistakes. Finally, this is the model of pregnancy. This has been developed by a joint project with the Swiss government, uh, Andreas Christ, uh, there and Niels Kuster. And you see we have biological models. These models are not used now by any of the national authorities to set standards for cell phones or laptops or any other devices. They're used when you want to evaluate the safety of a medical device, but not for the wireless devices that we're all using today. And this is a model that's being developed further of exposure, the red indicating um, pretty high exposures here. This is a seven-month-old exposure, and this is the nine-month-old. And I realize it's difficult to see uh, the, the heads here. There's, get, there, there's no question that we get exposure into the skin, and we want to protect the pregnant abdomen. And I really think it's wonderful that the manufacturers are giving this advice to people and we are working now to encourage them to give the advice in a clearer way that people can understand it. So finally, what do we want you to do? We want you to avoid carrying your cell phone on your body because, as Professor Taylor said, the closer you keep to your body, the more exposure you get. Cell phones have symmetrical antennas. So half of the radiation from the phone when it's held next to you gets into your body and that means that if you hold it out here, you're actually going to have less demand on the network and much less radiation exposure. It's the square in millimeters away from you. So this distance could be thousands of times less exposure than right here. Avoid holding any wireless device against your body for the same reason. iPads come with multiple antennas and it says in the iPad, don't keep it on the body. They are tested and they are called tablets not laptops, because they belong on tables. They do not belong on anybody's body. They're tested at a distance of 20 centimeters from the body. So they're not safe to use right on your body. Use your cell phone on speaker setting or with an air tube headset, and avoid using your wireless device in cars, trains, or elevators unless it's been tethered to your Bluetooth in your car, in which case you're using the car roof as the antenna. Otherwise, your head is the antenna. Avoid using cordless phones because cordless phones are like a mini base station. They are on 24-7, except in Switzerland where it's illegal to sell a cordless phone like that. They require that they only work when you use them, which we could very easily do in many other nations as well. When using Wi-Fi, try to use it only to download and then disconnect, when you're, especially if you want to give a device to a child. Do not hand a child your phone or you, any other device unless it's disconnected from the wireless. So download what you want before you give it to anybody, especially a child. And frankly, avoid prolonged or direct exposures. Figure out where your routers are and stay as far away from them as possible and get in the habit of turning them off. You can also ask your internet provider to power it down for you. Sometimes they will work at 10% of the power that they're on right now. You can unplug it and turn it off and sleep as far away from any wireless digital device as possible. If you must use your phone as an alarm clock, put it on airplane mode. Airplane mode means that you can carry it next to your body because you're not getting Wi-Fi radiation. So we don't want to go through with this issue what we went through with tobacco and asbestos. We have more than a million cases of lung cancer this year in the world alone. 
Many of them could have been prevented. I repeat, if you want the future to be different from the past, let's study the past and let's make sure we make it different. And for more information, please look at the Baby Safe Project website, as well as the websites for Environmental Health Trust and Grassroots Environmental Education. Thank you.